Today we have Dr. Stephen Greer, who I got to say is probably right now one of my biggest inspirations, fantastic teacher about consciousness and everything we discuss here on the channel. You may not be familiar with his name or you may. He's also the creator of two documentaries that have went totally viral, one of which is called Unacknowledged. Unacknowledged, you could find on Netflix, Amazon. Now get this over 600 million times. It's been viewed 600 million times, that documentary. You'll see all types of famous people discussing it. I even saw a lot of people telling Joe Rogan about it on his show. Then your more recent film just came out uh, yeah. within the last month or so, and that's Close Encounters of a Fifth Kind, and it's about contact with extraterrestrials and and what we would commonly call ufos aliens amazing and it's all about consciousness at the end and so i thought it was fantastic to bring dr greer on the channel because it's not like we're just talking about the prospect of of aliens with some random guy dr stephen greer is a traumatologist so dealing with the bloodiest of the bloody mm. blunt force trauma doctor that's worked with over 80,000 patients. He's also briefed uh, every single presidential, am I correct? Every single presidential cabinet since Bill Clinton on aliens, extraterrestrials, uh, you've briefed the Pentagon, the CIA, and you were just recently on Fox, CNN, and all that stuff about a week ago, which we'll get into why you were on just recently. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's all fair introduction of you, sir? Uh, that's a fair. Yeah. I'm a, you know, I'm a, uh, emergency doctor who, uh, got into this because, you know, my, my family, uh, my great uncle, no, he's my uncle. He was just older than, uh, my mom by quite a bit designed the machine that put the first man on the moon, the lunar module. So I had an interest in space since I was a little kid and had a sighting of a UFO close range. But I'm an emergency doctor, and uh, I'm out of that now, um, retired from doing emergency medicine. All they stay current. But what I'm focused on now is the, the planet. And I tell people, we're in an emergency. I know an emergency when I see one, and our planet is in a real emergency. Um, so I kind of think of my patients as Gaia and her uh, 8 billion children. So... <laughs> Uh, that's what I'm doing now. I'm trying to take care of the planet. Yep. So we'll get into that, what you mean by that humanity and the planet isn't in danger. But first, let's start at, you were just recently on Fox, CNN. This was just like last week. And I know you've been on many, many times. You've briefed mm -hmm. the White House, the CIA, the Pentagon, all of these types of things. But why was it that you were just recently again on oh, CNN? And well, Fox you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a very conservative talk show host named Laura Ingram, who I had been on her radio show years ago. And it's interesting, you know, I mean, I find that people who are interested in the subject crosses all the fractional lines of politics. So I go, okay, fine, whatever. Um, but it was about the fact that the Pentagon had released this footage which is actually in this documentary, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, which is on iTunes now and Amazon and all those. Uh, and it, it was our jet fighters were tracking uh, and had video image of this object that was moving against a, a very over 100 mile per hour jet stream wind and it could move and stop and do all kinds of non aerodynamic things. And uh, you know, the Pentagon had released it through a leak about two and a half years ago, uh, but it was a fake leak. It was a deliberate leak um, to a group that's trying to spin the whole UFO issue as a threat um, uh, to our civilization. In reality, we're the threat. The humans are the threat, not the ETs. By the way, I don't use the word alien because people think you're talking about someone from Guatemala or something. Um, okay. So... <laughs> Well, people use that word rather promiscuously, don't they? So, um, and it also is a loaded word because it's it's very xenophobic and negative. Um, my whole understood. Okay. My whole, we'll, we'll my whole mission is about unity, um, the fact that all of life in the cosmos is conscious, and that the consciousness at the root of all life is a singularity. There's only one conscious being. 
But anyway, that's not what the focus of the, the interview was on the media. It was the fact that the Pentagon had confirmed this footage of us chasing one of these UFOs. And of course, I mean, I'm, this is very old news for those of us been dealing with this for a very long time. But I said, yeah, of course, it's real. Uh, the, the thing that's the problem is the spin being put on it. So you have to understand if something gets covered by the big mainstream media and is released by the Pentagon, they're in cahoots together, basically with a narrative. And the narrative is this, um, that we're not alone, that it's a threat to our national security, and that we need a space force or whatever to fight the aliens so that we go to World War III. That's, that's, the, that's the, the thumbnail sketch of what these psychopaths want us to think. It's all, of course, made up uh, by a bunch of people who are trying to empower the military industrial complex all the way out into space. All right. So, uh, it, it, you know, when you see a leak like that, it's a deliberate leak. And, uh, you, you know, you mentioned you're in the San Diego area. There was a, a young boy who followed my work years ago who um, was part of a rock band called Blink. 182. He was one of the lead guys, uh, Tom DeLong, and he started a group looking into this. His whole effort got hijacked by some generals at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base who kind of brainwashed him about there being a threat. And there is no threat. But so he sort of started a group that first put together this leaked footage. That was two and a half years ago. Now the Pentagon is officially saying, yes, this is real and it's a real UFO. Although they changed the name now to a UAP. I mean, these keep making up uh, BS uh, acronyms. But uh, the truth is there are two kinds of things being seen out there. This is what I was trying to explain in the news media. Uh, a lot of them are ours. Uh, they're classified anti-gravity uh, devices that my uncle's company, Northrop Grumman, worked on. Lockheed Martin worked on there in San Diego. You have in La Jolla Science Applications International Corporation. These are big contractors with the US government that have projects dealing with so-called anti-gravity propulsion energy systems. Now, the ones that are that, that's in that footage from the Pentagon, I can't prove whether it was one of ours or not. It very well could have been because a jet pilot would not have been cleared to the level of secrecy to know that those things even exist in our air air force so it's very classified compartmented information and what you have to understand is that you know when you look at a footage piece of footage like that the first thing i have to ask is um you know is it real or memorex that old commercial is it is it real or is it uh meaning et or is it one of our uh test aircraft and they're not so test anymore they're actually very functional that zip around that are actually made by our um, very top secret classified aerospace projects. Um, but the, the reason I think it could have been one of ours that was used in this way was because the, the, the spin that was put on it uh, is part of the narrative that, you know, Adolf Hitler, his uh, aerospace genius, Werner von Braun defected to this country and on his deathbed said, you know, the military industrial complex is essentially going to hoax and make up an alien threat and that it would be a complete lie. And I think what we're seeing happen, the reason I did this documentary, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, is to start a global movement for we the people to make contact with these civilizations using higher states of consciousness, which we'll get into in a moment. Uh, because the military, a, a part of them, are trying to push this whole subject into conflict. And I think this footage that was just released is sort of a warm-up to the narrative that will be coming. Uh, actually, I, I'm quite certain that the way the COVID crisis has been handled is a warm-up uh, for how they want to manipulate our civilization in the future through fear. So I think we're, we have to be very conscious of the fact when we see something like this on the news, if it's in the mainstream news, you have to listen up and see what the narrative is, what the spin meisters in Washington are doing, because it's usually not very straight up. There's usually an agenda behind it. 
lot to unpack there before we get into what you're discussing and the mm-hmm. and the belief you have and the claims you're making with regards to fake alien in, invasion, government secrecy, things like that, whether a craft is ours or theirs. Mm-hmm. Before I ask a question, I live about five miles from To The Stars. So mm-hmm. I found mm-hmm. that very fascinating when you mm-hmm. discuss that in the documentary. I'm, I'm within a 30-minute walk, five-minute drive from mm-hmm. his building. Mm-hmm. And and I and I want to get more into that and what you mean by that of infiltrated to what you believe is a false narrative that we need to be afraid of interplanetary life and you're saying we don't and you're saying that there's an agenda behind that but first mm-hmm. you speak so matter of factly about aliens like so casually you're just like and I, I apologize using the word again interplanetary life you speak so matter of fact about that in UFOs and. I, I, I asked some of my audience before I said who, you know, is aware of Dr. Greer. Some were, some won't. I think for the most part, my audience is more so than 99% of interviews probably believes that they exist. You're speaking very matter of factly. So you're saying 100% mm-hmm. without a doubt, we have species. Personally, I've seen at least on 10 occasions some at least five of them like holy cow um so myself i've always been a believer but can you go to that question well i think that's settled science by now that number one we're not alone in the universe and we're here i mean what we did um with the disclosure project in 2001 we had the first uh, 22 of now i have 980 top secret military uh, intelligence corporate people come forward with documents, uh, photographs, radar tracings, videotapes, uh, et cetera. So the evidence is overwhelming that not only are we not alone in the universe, we're being visited by a, quite a large number of different civilizations, not just one, and that the public caricature of this subject is completely false. So uh, what I have done since 1990, this is the 30-year anniversary of me starting a group Um, when I was a young doctor, to actually make direct contact with these civilizations um, using something called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, or CE5, which is the name of this documentary you referred to that came out uh, actually in April now, about two months ago. Okay. And uh, this particular uh, concept is instead of people, you know, Googling on the Internet, I recommend that people go out under the stars and find out for themselves what's going on. Because usually what happens is that people are trying to get everything second, third, fourth hand. What what I'm saying is, why don't you go out and find out for yourself? Like you have seen things directly. We have now over 100,000 people around the world doing this on a regular basis, where they go out and use these techniques to make contact with these civilizations. All kinds of phenomena and amazing things happen. So I think we're much better off if we take control of this situation uh, and take responsibility for it ourselves rather than expecting Big Brother in Washington to tell us what the truth is. Because um, you always say, you know, those folks, those politicians and people in power in Washington, you know, how do you know they're lying? Their lips are moving. Um, They're they're pathological. So, uh, you know, I, I have a very dim view. I have a home in Washington. I have to deal with those folks a lot. But and there are some good people scattered around in the system, um, which is why I've made it this far, frankly. But, uh, you know, you don't (laughs) you don't get to where I am, you know, where I've been, you know, starting with Bill Clinton. I did a briefing for his CIA director on the. The thing that shocks people is that Clinton knew there was something to this subject and uh, so did his CIA director, Woolsey. Uh, and R. James Woolsey was asked by the president to look into UFOs and get the answers and bring them back for a briefing at the White House. And both the president and Woolsey and then a friend of Clinton's who he'd put into a high position in the Department of Justice dug into this and all of them were told to go away. They were told, we're not going to tell you a damn thing. So 
by then, this was in 93, I was asked to come up to Washington from my emergency department in North Carolina. I was took time off and came up and briefed the CIA director. So I don't know, it's, it's an amazing journey, you know, to be in your 30s briefing the director of the CIA on something that they're being denied access to, but that myself and my family and other people I knew had intimate knowledge of in classified projects. So that, that began a process where I realized, you know, I was already had formed a group that was going out making contact with these ETs and having the craft fly over uh, in the document. You'll see ETs that are like hovering in the field outside our circle, their bodies floating in the desert and stuff. I mean, cool stuff. Um, and people go, well, if that's happening, why doesn't the government just acknowledge it? And that's my question. Yeah. And this, well, this was actually what the CIA director asked. He says, why would this be so secret? And I said, look at how these things are flying. They're not using oil. They're not using rockets. They're not using jets. They're not using coal. They're not using a nuclear power plant. They're not using uranium. They're not using, they're not using any of the crap that we're using that's destroying the biosphere. So I tell you, know, one of the things that I tell all the people who at least state that they're concerned about the environment, which is about 70% of the United States population, is that there's nothing we're doing that's going to fix this problem yet. Nothing. Uh, but the technologies that would fix the problem today exist, and they exist in highly classified projects that are known as unacknowledged special access projects. That's where I got the name of the documentary that's on Netflix called Unacknowledged. Okay. So, uh, right. because what an unacknowledged special access project is, just to give people a little bit of a, a brief Please. on this, is that, you know, you have a lot of TSSCI, top secret special compartmented intelligence, highly classified projects. The ones that are special access projects you, you have to be clear to that compartment, that area. The unacknowledged ones are ones that nobody outside that compartment even knows exists. That includes the president, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. If, if they don't want someone to know about it, that is hermetically sealed. The entire UFO subject is managed through a various interconnected group of unacknowledged special access projects. And so my task over the last 30 years has been to penetrate many of those projects, get intelligence, documents, people, whistleblowers from inside those projects, and bring the information out to the public. Now, that wasn't what I initially started to do. <laughs> you know, I started on this path just wanting to teach people, uh, and we'll get into this in a moment, the meditation techniques that enable people to see remote places in space make contact with these civilizations and vector or guide them into where you're located. That's what a close encounter of the fifth kind is. And I had stumbled across this as a young boy, a young man. Uh, but ultimately, because this is what a lot of people don't know about my story, because I started a very early experiment with this in, in Florida on the beach near Pensacola, so I go down there in 92, and there are like 60 people that I'm just doing a sort of a workshop for on a weekend. And that night, that night we go out, I think it was a Saturday night in March of 92, we go out and we set up the, our group, and we're on the, right by the ocean at a state park. And, uh, it, you know, we start doing the meditation, and I'm training people to remote view, use consciousness to see where these ET craft may be, and then when they get a sense of one, intuitively guide them in by showing them like zooming into Earth from wherever you saw them, whether it was in our solar system or another galaxy or underneath the ocean near us. Well, a few minutes later, four of these ET craft go point, 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 pop, just materialize right in the sky, like right there. And no one had a very, we had the old high camera back then, but we got some footage of it. The footage you see of the boy going, holy damn hot shit. <laughs> yeah. guy, it's hilarious. That's a, a Wayne, uh, who was a guy on our team. Uh, that should young, be a meme. Yeah. Holy damn. Well, because it's, they're hovering right there. Yeah, and, uh, 
And of course, some people went, uh, this shit really works. I said, yeah, of course it works. This is what every Dalai Lama has known and every Vedic master has known. Everyone knows this. Every shaman in Native America. My, my grandmother was Cherokee, Native American. I said, everybody knows this. Uh, except, you know, really clueless people in the West who, you know, think, you know, everything is in a straight line. Um, but uh, so, so I'm going, dude, of course, I mean, this works. But I said, you got to be prepared for when it works. So here they come. <laughs> so, well, this, it, you know, unfortunately fortunately or unfortunately, that event that someone took a photograph of this and it ends up on the front page of the Pensacola paper. Uh, and so after that, you know, the entire intelligence community, people from the CIA, the Pentagon, military intelligence come after me with a heart on. And they're going, you know, they're going, what the hell are you doing? Because this, at that point, bang, it, they go, damn, dude, you know. And he, they realized that we had uh, uncovered the Rosetta Stone of interstellar communication, all right, using consciousness and using quanta of thought because these extraterrestrial civilizations have, you know, they have something that would look like our phone. That's uh, a little thing that interfaces with thought the same way we inter interface with a electromagnetic signal at the speed of light. But guess what? If you're going across the vastness of space, the speed of light's too damn slow. So you, the only thing that works is the speed of thought, but you have to have a way of actuating it, interfacing. So they've developed over hundreds of thousands of years what Elon Musk is trying to do with his company, Neuralink, where he's trying to, you know, he's trying to do this thing where you can think to your computer, no wires, and it does something. But he thinks he'll have something like that in 2025. But the CIA and folks like that knew the ETs had it in 1950. So, uh, you know, this is old news to anyone who's actually in the intelligence community, really old news. Uh, so this, this whole thing put, unfortunately, what I was doing with Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, this new documentary title, on the radar of the Pentagon and hmm. the CIA. And that's when I got invited eventually into some meetings. Uh, initially, they were hostile meetings hmm. where they were trying to tell me to shut, shut up, don't do this. Um, they tried to blackmail me um, and threaten me. Um, the head of Army Intelligence offered me back in 92, two billion dollars if I would be quiet. What? That was when that was when a billion dollars was a lot of money. I say jokingly now that they're minting a new unicorn Printing in Silicon Valley every week, you know, <laughs> but back in 92, there wasn't a, a, a unicorn company being minted every week in Silicon Valley. It and they weren't printing bucks. $10 trillion so, to buy the stock uh, market. It, it, it shows you, it, it'll give your audiences an idea of how corrupt the system is that, that a young doctor who stumbled across this would be not only threatened, but offered $2 billion to shut up. So, uh, then I told them, go, just go away. I'm not interested in your damn money. You know, I just waved them off. <laughs> so I, I gave them a big, you know, F you, see you later. So, you know. okay. So you, you were put on the map and you were, had already kind of developed this stuff on your own and you were doing it. I hate to say the word hobby, but you were doing it on your own. You were a yeah. medical doctor. You would go do it with your friends. Then you have this crazy one in Florida that a lot of people see. And then, then you're saying what happened as a result is, is that CIA and groups like that came to you and they said, yo, what are you doing? You need to stop this. What are you? Right. So that's what you're saying. Okay. Yes. And then that's when your career took off in that you got more and more involved because you saw that there was a direct agenda to stop this. Yeah. And I didn't know, you know, back in when I was a young doctor, I mean, I'm in my thirties. I had no idea. Um, you know, you think you know something and then you find out you don't know anything. So what did they do? Um, come to your house? I mean, what? No, so no, just no like, I was, well, yes, actually one did come to my house. Another invited me to a conference in Atlanta and that's where all the threats were made. Um, in, huh. in April of 92, in May of 92, I was in Colorado at a retreat with an astronaut, Brian O'Leary, uh, talking about disclosing all the UFO information and also doing the, um, uh, CE5, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative globally, and also bringing out the technologies. Because the third part of what I'm working on that I haven't mentioned yet 
is that you know these these objects are not using jet engines or internal combustion engines and if that technology could be brought forward for peaceful use we would fix the environmental crisis instantly there would be no pollution and no poverty on the earth within 15 years. So I tell people the good news is we have the solutions. The bad news is the most horrible fascists that you can imagine, they would make Adolf Hitler look like a choir boy, control those technologies and they are vicious and they have kept them secret at all costs. So that's the buzz saw I ran into because it's a very short distance. I mean, let me just... Here's how you know these guys think. If you disclose that the UFOs are real, any scientist with an IQ over mud is going to go, how the hell are these things operating if they're real? When that gets asked, there will be people who can answer it. And when that's answered, it's the end of oil, gas, coal, petrodollar, the banking system. The whole system that is running this planet, which is basically we're being run like a slave planet by the gangbangsters and petrodollar people. Um, the poverty that you see in the world would vanish in a generation and there would be no pollution in the world because the technologies that are running these UFOs are pulling energy out of what's called the zero point energy, the baseline energy of space, not outer space, but the space in this room where you're sitting. It's estimated uh, uh, something the volume of the inside of a coffee mug has enough energy to boil off all the world's oceans, potentially, in that amount of space. And it's called the zero-point energy field. So this got discovered, Tesla discovered it, by the way, not the fake Tesla with Elon Musk, but the real Tesla, the genius, actually did discover this, and his technologies were kept secret. Um, and he was mentored by a medical doctor named Dr. Walter Russell, who wrote the Universal One, and at Swannanoa, which is 10 minutes from my house here in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And he was a medical doctor who had had an enlightenment experience in contact with the ETs, and he mentored Nikola Tesla. That's how Tesla's brilliance got ignited, partially. Fascinating stuff. So what you are saying here is that the the ultimate because then the question everyone says is okay if it's out there why don't we know about it right because that that's the response and i'm sure you get that by the million and you are saying correct me if i'm right that there is a uh black budget total black ops faction of really you could call it the united states government but it's really these yeah. types of elite entities that control the world it's a global dark shadow system that has used the financial system in order to um, enslave the planet and profit off of oil wars, all of these things like that. And you're saying they've known about all of this stuff, but it's concealed because at the core, it, it maybe we would all know about it, but the reason we don't is because at the core, they don't travel through third dimension. They travel through um, higher dimensional planes and instantaneous travel because like I talk about on my channel, um, all the energy that ever was and ever will be is 100% evenly present at all places at all times. And they're traveling through, um, as you call it, the quanta of thought um, through consciousness. And they're using, when they're here in third dimension, they are harnessing essentially like what you would think like an anti-gravity device or a free energy system in order for those UFOs to run, they run off a free energy system and that's the thing that can't be released. And that's why everything's hidden to begin with. Is that accurate? That's part of the reason. Okay. Part of it is that um, the whole existence of life elsewhere would up in, you know, the, the weird Orthodox religious people who think the world's 6,000 years old, and um, we rode dinosaurs bareback out in Wyoming and whatnot. <laughs> but, I mean, there's a museum over here in Kentucky dedicated to this. So, have you heard I mean, the Bill Hicks you know, it, it, there are a whole lot of reasons for the secrecy. Part of it is okay. it would terminate. And I, I had a NASA scientist say this to me because we had detected structures on Mars that were extraterrestrial. Hmm. And he knew it, I knew it. And I said, yeah, well, why can't, that's an old structure. Those are millions of years old. Why can't you release that? 
Hmm. There's no, because if we did, it would terminate the orthodox belief systems of every organized religion on earth. Huh. Huh. And I said, yes, it would, but it's childhood Zen. Let's grow the heck up. Um, he says, no, you don't understand how powerful those groups are. And then we got into a discussion about the current, you know, UFOs being seen. And there were some structures on the moon that were imaged by the lunar orbiter, which before we landed, we're taking digital pictures of the moon. Okay. And some of them were old structures, obelisks and things. Others were new, newer. And uh, so they were going, who's up there? What's up there? Hmm. And um, so it gets into then the question is, well, if these uh, UFOs are going through trans-dimensional space-time using technologies that if they were disclosed would completely be, I mean, you, you people think of an iPhone is disruptive technology. There's nothing disruptive about the internet. I mean, it's still all electromagnetic flotsam at the speed of light. There's nothing revolutionary about any of this stuff that everyone thinks is so cool. It's like really lame, frankly, totally lame. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big, like, techno-skeptic about that. You know, it's mostly self-congratulatory egotism. Oh, look how advanced we are. Or it's Actually, like breadcrumbs that are released, too. Yes, like, these are the breadcrumbs. It's like, it's like Colonel Corso, uh, he wrote the day after Roswell, this colonel who had worked on this. He says, oh, yeah, the transistors, integrated circuits, fiber optics. These were all spinoffs from studying the ET spacecraft we shot down in the, in the forties in, in New Mexico. And, but that the real heart of the technology, how they run, where they get their energy from, how they are floating through the sky and moving at right angles at 200,000 miles per hour. And they make turns like this, that technology, they don't want out because the, there's a thousand trillion dollars literally in oil and reserves and corporations and public utilities that would become unnecessary completely. You know, they'd be like the Royal typewriters or horse and buggies, you know, I mean, who needs it? So um, that's what they're trying to protect. And I understand that. I mean, it's a, you know, I'm not saying this in a cavalier way. It, it's a very big transformation of civilization and the economy. But if we don't do this, we're facing an extinction level event coming up. You know, so our civilization is going to become extinct if we don't fix this and it needs to be fixed. So that's why I started the disclosure project that, you know, is kind of talked about in the movie Unacknowledged, because that's sort of very, you know, to give people context. What Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, which is really sort of, I feel, the most significant I agree. information we put out is to let people know that don't wait for the government to do this. We, each individual who's awake, has the responsibility to do this ourselves and to reach out to these civilizations and create a, a rapprochement, uh, to create a dialogue with these civilizations because the military have totally mucked it up. They've screwed it up so badly. Um, and everything being put out to the public on this subject, and I hate to say this, particularly through the UFO community and the internet, it was at least 90% false narrative, hmm. minimum 90%. So if you Google this subject, most of the stuff that pops up is stuff that's been embedded by the intelligence community to scare people. For example, one of the things we deal with in the documentary of uh, this Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind is... Uh, you know, we have an Air Force intelligence officer who came forward. I kind of surprised him in the interview when I talked to him that, about what a deceptive INW, a false flag event is. So the proper military term is a deceptive indication and warning. Uh, and he knew I knew the lingo because I've done briefings at the Pentagon for the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, three-star general, on this problem. And that there is a plan to hoax a threat from extraterrestrials so that the world could be united around a militaristic uh, organizational entity. And that this is completely hoaxed. This is what Werner von Braun, who invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler, warned about on his deathbed. Um, his spokesperson is on my team, Carol Rosen. 
And she and I have been working to try to keep weapons out of space and to keep space free of conflict. But unfortunately, there are people who've already put killer weapons on satellites up there that are targeting these ET spacecraft. So it's already reached the point of of an enormously dangerous situation. So the only solution to that, as I see it, isn't going to be from whatever president is coming. Look, I've, I've dealt with every president since Clinton. Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump. As soon as Trump got nominated, I put a briefing together for him that was put into his hands. Hmm. I didn't put it to his hands. A member of my team did. Okay. Uh, but the point I'm making is I don't see that those guys have the no offense to the presidency. The presidency has pretty much been castrated. Um, it does not have the control. Over Elaborate. The yeah. It, it Elaborate. Doesn't have- what, what do you mean? Because somebody thinks the president, like, dude, you are the no. president, and no. you're saying that's not at all, and it's really more of a figurehead, and there's other operations that are people there, are there forever. There are people, yeah, there's people so much more powerful than the president. Um, that's sort of an urban myth that the presidency has an all-access pass. Uh, you know, I'll give, well, the, the example I gave you when, when Clinton was trying to find out about the UFO issue. And he was basically told, we're not going to tell you anything. They just brushed him aside. So you would think, you know, that's an act of treason, which it is, according to the Constitution. But these are people who are running illegal projects. And if they're breaking the law, they don't care if they break the Constitution. I mean, these little niceties that we think of that are what the foundational uh, law of our society. I mean, people who are fundamentally sociopaths and criminals, they don't give a damn about that. So unfortunately, the people who run these uh, unacknowledged special access projects are criminals. They are illegally run projects using black budget money, um, and they really could care less what the president thinks. Now, even when it's a little more complicated, uh, let me give you an example. So it just makes it very real for people. I use these these sort of stories uh, of what happened to, to me over the years. Um, some years ago, I was asked to brief the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, J2 is what it's called. Okay. Now, that's the guy who puts the intelligence briefing together for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States Pentagon. Okay. Very high position. He was an admiral. And before I did the briefing, I, gave, I sent a, a briefing document uh, uh, beforehand, a paper document, with several hundred, maybe 500 pages of uh, top secret documents, CIA stuff. And one of the documents, the one I put on the very front, I did it on purpose, was a National Reconnaissance Office NRO document. And that's the super secret satellite spy that runs all the satellites Hmm. called NRO. Most people don't even know it exists. Okay. Um, If if you go to their headquarters above the door, it says, we own the night. Hmm. They can see everything at night, day, anywhere on the planet. Hmm. So uh, that document had a was uh, out of uh, so-called Area 51. It, it was a document warning about some civilians who were trying to spy on that area, where we had not only ET craft we were studying underground, but were test flying some of our own out there uh, that were the man-made UFOs, I call them. Um, so. Those, uh, this was a security alert and it was a secret document, but I got a copy of it and it listed the names, the code project names and numbers. So I said, oh, okay, this is interesting because it was actionable intelligence, what's called actionable intelligence. I went, this is really cool because it means I can give this to the Admiral and he can look up this group and find out. So I put it on the top. When I first put together the briefing for uh, the CIA director for Clinton, I didn't have this document. I I have a lot more now. Mm -hmm. Um, I have thousands and thousands of stuff like this. So I said, okay, well, he got it. He recognized one of the names, but he didn't know quite what they did. Hmm. Um, You know, it's a trillion dollar project, you know, the Pentagon, CIA, Homeland Security. Um. So he gets hold of them and he calls them up. He goes, hey, this is Admiral uh, Wilson. I'm uh, head of intelligence joint staff. They say, oh, yes, sir. We know who you are. He says, I want to be read into this project, I mean, briefed. And they say, sir, you don't have a need to know. 
he said, God damn it, I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. How can I not have a need to know? They said, sir, we will not discuss this with you. And they hung up on him. He later was threatened with having one of his stars removed uh, as an admiral if he continued to push on this subject. Uh, and, and so here you have somebody that any, if you were to talk to a thousand people on the street, every single person would say that person, an admiral of that rank who is in charge of the entire intelligence assessments for the joint chiefs of staff of the Pentagon would have access to everything. He doesn't. Hmm. These unacknowledged special access projects do not tell anyone they don't want to know. So if they think somebody People said, well, then who knows? I said, they only tell people who are similarly sociopathic. In other words, if you're willing to engage in criminal activities, murder, the destruction of the planet, false flag operations, and every other kind of nasty business, they will give you a little information and then bring you in slowly into the structure. But if you're a good guy, I call them the white hats at the CIA and Pentagon. There are plenty of good people there, actually. They won't tell you the time of day. So, and, and this is a pattern I discovered in the 90s. It was, a, it was very upsetting for me personally because, you know, I went over to England and met with the British Minister of Defense head. He was retired, but he was a five-star admiral. They don't have those anymore. We used to call them sea lords. <laughs> how quaint. I mean, how British. A sea lord. Um, I love the grandiosity and bombast of the British. It's just fantastic. Um, <laughs> I find it endlessly entertaining. Yeah, it's hilarious. But, um, but so I'm sitting at his, his cottage, as he called it, in Hampshire, this huge old thatched roofed house. And, the, and it's Lord Hill Norton. And he had been head of the military committee for NATO. And he was also head of the Ministry of Defense in the United Kingdom, which also means he was head of the equivalent of our CIA. And okay. I said, all right, they're head of everything. Okay. And he told me, he said, the whole time I was head of the Ministry of Defense and all, I never was told anything about this. He only found out about it after he retired through material that I and others were putting out. And he says, why wouldn't they have told me? And I said, well, let me answer your question with a question. And he got rather irritated. He thought I was being a cheeky Yankee. Uh, but I said, just bear me out. What would you have done if you'd found out that there was a cabal of sociopaths who had arrogated to themselves the control over a subject, the disclosure of which would solve the world's energy crisis, the environmental problems, in poverty around the world, and that they've engaged in murder, mayhem, unconstitutional and illegal activities for 70 years to do this. And he jumped up out of his chair. I wouldn't have stood for it for a bloody goddamn minute. I said, that's why they didn't tell you, dude. <laughs> they didn't tell you because they knew you wouldn't go along with this kind of stuff. So I always tell people it's actually not as complicated as people make out in all their conspiracy theories. Yeah. It's like it's a very simple thing. Can you be controlled and purchased or not? Now, when they offered me $2 billion, I said, go jump off in the lake. You know, see ya. I was actually more blunt. I won't say use the language I use. <laughs> it was a big F you. But, and I said, I'm not interested in your money. I'm not rich, I'm a, but I'm a medical doctor. I don't need your freaking money. And I said, I'm going to do what I think is right for humanity and for the human future. That made them very upset because they knew that my value system wasn't purchasable. It couldn't be bought. Um, and they, they always look for, you know, I had a man who worked on this committee. It's called the Majority Intelligence Committee. Ironically, the acronym is MAJIC, M-A-J-I-C. Um, and he said, you know, look, he says, doctor, we've given over 10,000 people at least $10 million a piece or more to secure their cooperation with our project. Mm -hmm but we think that you're worth more than that. This was another attempt to buy me off. Um, that was about a year later um, or two years, two years later. So I just tell people I'm not interested, you know, now they've given up. I mean, I'm not getting any offers. Um, like they got the, the memo that I don't, you're not wanted. I don't care about their money, their power 
or anything else. And plus I tell them, I said, look, I've got hundreds of people inside your command who are giving me information all the time. I already know what you're doing. I know yeah. where you're doing it. I know what your technologies are. Uh, and I also know why the ETs are here. And it has nothing to do with the, the, the false information you're putting out there through TTSA and other entities. Um, so, uh, and you know, one of the things that a lot of people, they, they Google the subject, they'll go see all these things about abductions. Yeah. I know the, I look, I, I, I've met 12 different guys who don't know each other who have been on abduction teams for covert unacknowledged special access projects, staging alien abductions. It's easy. It's very if you well, okay, have but here's the question: Why? Because yeah. you're saying you're saying the CIA or factions of the government is staging alien abductions. That that's Absolutely. all a hoax to go with this fear agenda to be afraid of. Sure. of multi- but and why? That's, why? Why are they doing that? Why? That's because that's two things. One, <clears throat> it creates a diversion. Okay. So in other words. I have a guy at the National Security Agency explained it to me this way. We call it DDT. I said, oh, that's an insecticide poison. He said, no, no, no. We call it DDT. It stands for you set up a decoy, create a distraction, and you trash the subject. DDT. Got it. <clears throat> and this was the right-hand man to the director of the National Security Agency, who is a supporter of mine. Uh, in fact, that document I have about how the CIA killed Marilyn Monroe yeah, that was that fascinating. Was, that was given to me by that man. He was wow. the right hand, shoulder to shoulder, with the director of the National Security Agency. Hmm. So, you know, I have some badass people on my team, but they're <laughs> really cool. But, you know, who, who are sick of the secrecy. I mean, that's right. why they're giving me all this stuff. But the point I'm making is, is that if you, if you can make people think this it's sort of like the Wizard of Oz. Did you ever see that old old yep. movie called The Wizard? And there's the old crud mudge and behind the curtains pulling the lever, scaring yep. the hell out of Dorothy. That's what these guys are. So they want to set up a, 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 a sort of a, a circus through the UFO subculture and TTSA and all these other groups to say, hey, there's a threat from outer space and they're doing mech, cattle mutilations and abductions. I know the guys who've been doing those, literally. I mean, I personally know them, uh, a number of them. So, and then, you know, if you look at this new documentary, we have this Air Force intelligence guy who, who worked on the UFO subject for over a decade uh, out of Kirkland Air Force Base, who states point blank, he says, oh yeah, we did that. When I asked him, is the military staging these abductions? So now there are people who've had contact with ETs and there are people who've had these other experiences and the intelligence community is happy to let everyone think it's all the same. They want everything mixed together in people's minds. Why? Because then people go, well, there are the good ETs and then there are their bad ones. And the mm-hmm. good ones are, you. if you look at the narrative, you know, now that we're in Black Lives Matter going on, let me tell you what's going on with this. This is interstellar racism. They want everyone to think, okay, if, if it's an ET civilization that looks like they're from Sweden, blonde hair, white skinned, the women have nice breasts, those are the good ETs. The bad ETs are short, they have funny looking noses. It's just racism. I mean, let's call it out for what it is. It's interplanetary racism. Hmm. So what, the, what these guys are very good at doing is manipulating human psychology and Hmm. social engineering, where they will go, ah, let's create another boogeyman, something for people to be afraid of. And let's do this in a way so that people are really scared of everything alien that goes bump in the night. Because that'll keep people uh, prepared for when we pull this, pull the button, push the button, and hoax an alien attack, Hmm. which is what they're planning to do. So you really think that's going to happen? You really I, I think, think they're actually going to hoax an alien invasion and we're going to see that in our lifetime? I think it can be done any day they wish. And I think it will happen unless enough people wake up that it's a hoax. So in other words, that what I'm doing is preventative medicine. I'm trying to I'm trying to tell people you need to be aware of this possibility so we're not like the, the old Who song, we won't be fooled again. That was about the Vietnam War. Well, guess what? We were fooled again. 
Yeah. When we after 9/11 we went into Iraq, we're being fooled again with how we're how the whole COVID thing is being managed. So people are getting fooled over and over again, and they do it through fear. Remember, fear shuts down spirit. Fear shuts down intellect. A uh, fear shuts down higher conscious capabilities. And so there's a big part of the, this uh, agenda that is about creating the specter of a threat. And that's, that is the fear of, of, of ETs and aliens is a big part of their agenda for the last 70 years. And they've done a very good job of it. Cause if you look at most Hollywood movies and most things on this subject, it's all very terrifying. When in reality, what's terrifying is these corrupt people behind the curtain, you know, pulling the lever, scaring the hell out of the public because they have an agenda. How do you grow? How do the warmongers grow the military industrial complex? You know, as as the CIA director for Obama said, look, we're spending one hundred and ten billion dollars a year chasing 70 Al Qaeda members around the desert in Afghanistan. 70, seven zero. Um, and so at a My certain fear point, you just scare the yeah. crap out of everyone to justify the, the, the expenditure and the amount of money printing. Yeah. But how do you grow that industry unless you oh. have another bigger enemy? Okay. Understood. Okay. All right. So you need a bigger enemy because no one's going to stand for another middle Eastern war. So you need to get another enemy because you can't say now we're going to go to Kuwait. You know, because well, the there, there, could, there could be another couple of intermediate steps. But okay. to be honest with you, the, the big one, the, their, their trump card is playing the alien threat. And this has been known by people in the intelligence community. I've had multiple people who've been involved in the planning sessions for this. Huh, interesting. So I think this is why Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind is so important. Yep. It's going to the public saying you have this whole screwed up situation. I doubt we're going to have a president or a Congress that's going to resolve this. Because they'll get yeah. killed, right? I mean, Jeff, I've told my audience and I played clips of JFK talking about his, I played the actual clip of his speech on secrecy and secret societies and right. a monolithic conspiracy that right. controls it all. Eisenhower warning everybody about a rogue faction of the military industrial complex. Right. So what you're saying here, your intention, right? We talk a lot about intention on my channel right. and purpose behind right. it. You're not just doing a sci-fi conversation because it's cool. You you feel a deep sense of purpose and spiritual mission to release this um, because people need to be aware of it. There is a prospect of them false flagging an alien invasion to – um, unite potentially a one world government and a, and a global militarized state and to right. continue to preserve the, um, the oil hegemony of the world and all of these types of things. And you're saying, look, this might be happening. And for us to advance as a human civilization, as a human species, um, to truly advance, we must become aware of the power of consciousness and we must make our own discoveries of that we aren't alone in the universe and that there are further advances that we can make in technology, free energy systems, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a spiritual purpose. You're doing this for a reason, not just like, hey, this is cool, right? Well, and the the ultimate reason is that we have to move our civilization on to the next level of its spiritual evolution. And that can't happen if, you know, half the world is starving or half the world is impoverished. So it's all part and parcel. A lot of people want to divide this up into different, you know, partial solutions and you have to have a holistic solution, but at the root of it is the spiritual problem because, um, you know, one of the things we, we pivot to from this sort of discussion that's in the early part of this film, close encounters of the fifth kind to the solution. Right. And we talk about quantum physics and the studies that have been done that show that consciousness isn't limited to space and time. Uh, That actually the mind, and and everyone makes this too abstract, but I always tell people, just think about the fact that you're hearing my voice or your voice have sun coming in right here. Um, And it's it's one of these things where uh, when you have people considering what consciousness is, they're usually get 
trapped into what they are conscious of or a technique or what have you. I'm talking about the faculty of being awake, aware of awareness, the aware state. That state of consciousness that enables you to hear my voice and me to see you and all your listeners to hear this, that is a singularity. There's one consciousness in the cosmos. This has been proven in physics, by the way. And every point in space and time is connected to every other point in space and time because it is all part of a conscious holographic universe, a conscious quantum. And so when we think of our minds, we always trap it in our egos. But in reality, there's this great unbounded aspect of consciousness that's illuminating our individuality. It's like a light, it's like the sun shining through that window. It can shine through a hundred windows in this house and each window is different, but the sun is a singularity. So the field of consciousness is this singularity. And when we, in meditation, uh, and I don't know if you know this, but before I was a uh, a doctor, I was a meditation teacher. I do know this, yeah. Yeah, and I went all over the world. You know, Louise Hay was a student of mine and all kinds of freaks. Uh, And it was back (laughs) in the days when (laughs) the Beatles and Mia Farrow with, with Maharishi, and I was a golden boy going around the world setting up meditation teachers when I was 19. Your hair Um, looked more like mine then, I think, right? Yes, I did. I was a total, complete... (laughs) Uh, renegade for reek, uh, but um, you know, I don't know, shame in that at all. I, we had a great time, and and I went around with a buddy all over the world setting up meditation centers. But what I learned, I became a, 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 a student of the ancient Sanskrit and the Vedas, and both the Buddhist and, and the Sanskrit um, origins in the ancient Vedas and um, Vedanta and began to study consciousness and the experience. So I spent, I had a couple years where I spent eight hours a day in meditation and had all kinds of extraordinary uh, experiences. Uh, And all of that started because when I was 17, uh, I had a near death experience. I was very sick and died. And I was raised in a devout atheist family. We didn't believe anything. And so I thought, well, you know, when I had this near death experience, I didn't have the, the sort of the angry man at the pearly gate sort of nonsense. It was like I'd always loved nature and space. I'd always been drawn to it. So I go out into outer space, but I didn't even have my astral body, my body of light. I was just a point of consciousness. Hmm. And that merged with the universal consciousness, the mm-hmm. cosmic consciousness. And that experience was um, so beautiful. When I'm 17. I didn't understand it intellectually, but I experienced it. And that set me on a path of wanting to learn how to meditate, uh, how to get to that state innately. And that's actually how I had contact with the ETs six months later. I was sitting up on a mountain in North Carolina as an 18 year old guy meditating up at over 5,000 feet up in the Blue Ridge mountains. And um, I saw this right before sunset. I saw this uh, this silver disc ship that I, same thing I'd seen when I was eight or nine with in my neighborhood where I grew up. I saw one broad daylight. This was late in the afternoon, and I look at it and I go, "Oh, they're back!" And it's so cool. I said, "Well, I knew who they were because uh, after my sighting when I was eight or nine, I had continuing contact with those occupants uh, in the dream state, lucid dream state." at night, um, which is very important, by the way. We can get to that in a little bit, how important the lucid dream state is. Yeah, yeah. Move that way if you can a little, because you're, you're sun, uh, one or the, you've got more sun that way. I, th- I think if you go towards <laughs> your left shoulder, there you go. Yeah. So um, a lot of the things that we talked about earlier, right, we're talking about uh, black budget, government secrecy, all those types of things. I don't want to go too much more into that because – Oh, we could talk all day. You've yeah. discussed it at length and you know, there's a lot of interviews. It's in your it's in the documentary Unacknowledged. If you want to just talk about only that and somebody wants to learn more about that, there's an interview you did with Alex Jones where it's all you guys discuss. The reason I brought you on and I thought it would be a good fit is not because you're some random guy that's like, Hey, I saw a UFO. You right. you're tying everything back into consciousness, everything you just said could have been one of my videos. 
Um, mm. And it's why I understand a lot of what you're saying about how these spacecrafts travel because um, third dimension is like a fingernail to the universe. It's a very small bandwidth of all the universal energy. And we talk all about these types of things. And so um, as you, as we're beginning to discuss this, why don't, as we're going into it in more depth, why don't you give us a quick overview of the five different levels of contact between um, these, these beings and leading up into your most recent documentary? I think that would be a good way to subway it in. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, a close encounter of the first kind is like what I was just describing, seeing an object within a certain fairly close range to where you can see the structure. Okay. Um, a, a close encounter of the second kind is when there's some kind of physical evidence that results, like if they okay. land and leave a marking or some physical, like a radar trace or something like that. Okay. So that's okay. a close encounter of the second. Everyone knows a close encounter of the third kind from the Spielberg movie where you have an encounter with an ET okay. biological being, an actual uh, extraterrestrial uh, being. And that's uh, a close encounter of the third kind. Close encounter of the fourth kind is when you actually are taken and go on board a craft or, or have a contact where you go somewhere with the ETs. Um, and a close encounter of the fifth kind is the first category that is not passive. All the others sort of just happen. Okay. Oh, incidentally, a close encounter of the fifth kind is when we use our intention to make contact as ambassadors, as children of Earth, to these civilizations. So that, and, and, and that's using a number of different protocols. You can use a lot of different techniques, but the, the central concept behind it is that we're taking responsibility as citizen diplomats from Earth to these civilizations, and we are inviting them to come, as opposed to just stumbling across something. So there's an intentionality to it. Mm. There's a purposeness, purposefulness to it, where we're saying we're going to take responsibility for the relationship between humans and in humanity and these civilizations and not just sort of relegate it to covert programs. We're going to do this ourselves. So that's why the close encounters of the fifth kind concept is so important because it's the first one that's empowering to the individual and groups of individuals and to humanity as a whole to actually step into the relationship with these civilizations. And I will tell you that from my experience when I was 18, where I went on board a craft and sort of created these techniques with the ETs, that was how it happened. I, I was teaching them about you how went, you met. Uh, beings, you went onto their craft, and that's how you developed this thing yeah. that you teach now about that about doing it. That's what you're saying. Yeah, it took about. We, we were, I guess, I was out there maybe three hours. So you were literally like this to the, like me and you to them like that. Yeah, but transdimensionally. So I was like touched on my right shoulder. The ET came over to me. I was up on the mountain meditating, and I went into this deep meditation. At the end of which. I was in the same state I was in that when I died six months earlier. So, so you were in was, like the astral was, plane or were you in like fifth? Dimension? No, I was in my body, but okay. my consciousness was fully integrated uh, with a Brahman consciousness and unity consciousness. Right. Okay. Even though my eyes were open and I looked up at the stars and the Milky Way was overhead up near this fire tower up and where I was on top of this mountain and it gotten very dark and, um, I realized that there was sort of a glowing over the crest of the mountain just below. And then I saw this creature I thought was a deer. I mean, I didn't know anything about this stuff. Um, and it, I, it looked like a, a deer standing up <laughs> on all two legs, but had these beautiful eyes and touched me on my right shoulder. And I was wearing a ski jacket because it was very cold up there. It was October of 1973. So this was, um, you know, 47 years ago. And this touched me on my right shoulder and all my hair stood on end. And I had a lot more hair then. And, um, and I just sort of teleported. Boom. Went point to point onto the craft. And then I stayed in that transdimensional state for three or four hours, meditating and teaching the ETs about 
what it's like for a, a young man on earth to experience cosmic consciousness and how that can be used to make contact in the future. And so this went on for a long time. And then um, I came back maybe a quarter of a mile down this gravel road that went up to the top of this mountain. Uh, I didn't, I didn't come back where I left from. I came back further down that road. Um, and I thought maybe it had been 20 minutes, but it had been like three or four hours. Wow. Um, yeah, because there's no, the time, the sense of time and space is different in that dimension. Um, and um, I sort of had this strange uh, anti-gravity field around me. So I, you know how you see them leaping on the moon? Like, yep. like I had no gravity. So I had this sort of, I was almost like quasi levitating down the mountain where I, each, I could just bound and go 20, 30 feet. It mm. was like really cool. Um, but that wore off by the time I got down to this little town where I was living wow. up in the mountains of North Carolina, um, up in Boone, North Carolina. And there was a school up there, Appalachian State University I was going to. And um, I thought, well, this is really interesting. I didn't know what I was going to do with this. But I started practicing the techniques that I was that we had sort of jointly developed because it had to be joint because they had to understand how humans would do this. So I started this whole thing where every night I'd start, I'd, before I'd go to bed, I'd go into a deep meditation. I would remote view where the ET craft might be, and I would guide them to come in to this little area. And every night I did, they were spotted, and the police, and they were on radar. It was crazy. I stopped doing it. I, I, I stopped doing it because it was like, freaked me out. I was like 18 years old. I was like, what am I doing? Um, so... You know, the following year, I went off to become a, a meditation teacher. Um, so I sort of finished college when I was 19 and then went all over the world doing that. But it wasn't until the 1990, many years later, that I just started to do this as a formal effort. And that's because I was I had these ETs show up in my house three different nights in a row, uh, three months in a row, who gave me instruction about. And this was in 1990. Jan it was the full moon of January 1990, the full moon of February 1990, and the full moon of March 1990. And I went, I'm a doctor with four kids living in this house with a golden retriever. You know, I mean, this was the last thing I thought I would be doing at that point in my life. And um, basically, I was told it was time to start a project. Were you on psychoactive drugs at this time? Somebody no, might I've ask. Actually, I've never done any drugs at all. Wow. Uh, ever. I, I don't mind a scotch or, you know, I, when I was younger, I mean, I didn't care if someone smoked some weed or something, but I've, I've never done any, any cycle. Understood. And I knew that, but asking for somebody that might be thinking that. So when I think about all, no, no, this, I didn't do any of that stuff. This was all based on consciousness. I always tell people, you know, whether you do ayahuasca or not, um, everything that can be achieved through that, you can achieve naturally without the damage to the neurons um, through uh, development of consciousness techniques. So I, I teach people, uh, I go, on, I take people on expeditions for a whole week where we go out in the wilderness and I teach people these techniques, but we have an app by the way, that just came out. Cool. Cause obviously these groups are only 20 or 30 people. Right. Um, and there are 8 billion people on the planet, but there's an app called the CE five contact app that has all the meditations and the training for, for making okay. contact and it has a messaging feature. So you can see who else is in like San Diego hmm. that you can hook up with to go out and they have a team. Oh, that's to do cool. This. Yeah. And it's called this. I didn't know the messaging aspect. That's for everyone listening. I, there's a, you know, with the amount of people that I talk to on my videos, there are a lot of people that say my biggest problem is I don't have any like minds and no one I'm around. So that sounds like a great thing that if that, is. if that is you and you have that problem that, Sounds like that might be a fantastic app and thing to consider. So let me ask you, Dr. Gurr. So when, when I think about all of this, right, so there's, and I talk about on the channel, there's one mind in the universe. There's really only one universal energy, um, and there's different frequencies of that consciousness or different vibratory rates of it. So really a uh, extraterrestrial from the Andromeda galaxy is really, I'm actually one with it. It really isn't an extraterrestrial. It's really just a different frequency level of that universal energy. So because we're all 
hooked up to this universal consciousness. This is how the power of intention and the power of consciousness comes into play with your ability to contact them and thus have sightings and such? Exactly, because that was the experience I had was the experience of the universality of consciousness, which immediately it was quite clear to me that, you know, there's a saying in the Vedas, all this is that, hmm. meaning all that exists in the cosmos is this consciousness field resonating and phasing as a star system or a photon or your body or me, your individual soul or mind, uh, the wall behind you, it's all awake. And now that sounds very crazy until you, have the, my until you have the experience where you see it. But then what's cool is that science recently has reached the point where they're proving this is true. And we go through this in this documentary, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, where we show the science of consciousness as a sort of quick trip through the fact that, you know, plants can interface with consciousness. Um, you know, random number generators that are quantum flux generators that spit out zeros and ones, you can put your awareness on it, just your intention and shift it to more ones than zeros. You can do all kinds of things remotely in consciousness that have been proven now scientifically. And of course, this is the stepchild of science because it runs against the grain of reductionism, where everything is just yeah. broken into parts and parts and parts. In a very right. Newtonian model of physics where we're really looking at it like everything is solid matter and, you know, energy is this unexplainable, magical phenomena, side effect of it. So my audience grasped all this, right? This is what we talk about. But we talk about it, I guess, from a more uh, third dimensional perspective in that if you know all this and that consciousness is everything, you could actually use it to... Uh, to create reality, to materialize and manifest things in your life. And now you're saying the same thing is how we advance the human civilization and make contact and things like that, right? Right, because this is one of the things that has been called the 1% effect. I want to talk about this for a minute. Please. This is why it's so important. You know, we, we go through this in the documentary that they've done studies in quantum physics, for example, with... Um, what's called superfluidity in helium. So let's say you have a container of helium, you cool it down to absolute zero. And as you get it colder and colder, you begin to get coherence of the atoms, the helium atoms. Um, and when you reach about 1% of the helium atoms that become coherently aligned, the entire container goes bang, like a magic. It goes from this very violent, Island roiling, boiling sort of container of chaotic energy, pretty much describes the earth now, to this coherent, very coherent, peaceful, almost magical field of what's called superfluidity and helium. But it doesn't take 51%. This is not an election. It's 1%. So, so what's interesting is that they did a similar study with meditators, consciousness. And they would say, okay, there's a town of 20,000 people. Let's go in there with 200 meditators for a week and have them be meditating and be coherent. When they did that, crime rates fell, ER visits fell, uh, fell down, you know, were lower. All kinds of violent activity stopped. Uh, and there was this increased coherence, even though the rest of the town didn't know those people were in town. They didn't know they were there at all. So there's this morphogenic field, it's called. There's this field effect from consciousness that is affected, but it seems to be very powerful at around that 1%. So what I'm trying to do is to get 1% of the population. So in America, say that'd be 3.3 million people to be doing group meditations, but with the intent of creating universal peace. So not only peace on earth, but peace out in space. Because if we create world peace, but we trade world peace for interplanetary war, we're not going forward, we're going backward, which is what these guys are planning. They want to unite the world around a military junta and say, oh, we have world unity now. It's one world, but we're going to fight this star system. That's how insane these people are. So we're, that's not going forward. So 99% of the UFO subculture unfortunately, is really dedicated to 
putting out narratives that would run against that. So what we're trying to do is say, all right, what if 1% of us actually did something constructive and we would meditate together, go out under the stars, do this. And you're, the motto of the organization is one universe, one people. Mm. It's a, it's a, the concept is in the whole co- of the entirety of the cosmos, there's really only one people and we are they. So the sense of oneness comes from not the fact that we're all homo sapiens, you know, monkeys that got upright and, you know, have a little more intelligence than a gorilla, although <laughs> nominally, um, that <laughs> you don't get me into my acerbic commentary about this. <laughs> but, but the point I'm making is um, <laughs> we're all one conscious being. And so we have more alike with these aliens. That's why I don't like to use the word yeah. than if it's similar. So it depends on what you're focusing on. This is one of the problems we're having right now with, with the sort of endless racism and tribalism of our society is that it isn't going to be fixed until we realize that deep within every single intelligent being, and in fact, within everything, plant life, animals, the spirit of the earth, consciousness itself has manifested Gaia. And the earth is a conscious, she's female, by the way. She has a personality, but it's a female being who is conscious. And you can connect to the Gaia consciousness, the consciousness of the earth. I, I, I've done this out from being out in space. It's a magnificent experience. But until we realize that the the thing that's going to weave all of us together in a peaceful state of oneness isn't endless tribalism. You know, it's going to be infinite oneness. And so the crisis is essentially a, a, a spiritual one. The root of all racism is basically tribalism. The tribalism where one tribe exalts themselves over another. And this has been the bane of human existence. Now, what these sociopaths are doing in the intelligence community, they're trying to present another narrative. Well, humans can all be united, but there are these awful aliens we need to fight. They're trying to create another otherness. And, you know, the Native American people thought it was so strange that in the West, that, you know, as, as Europeans came over, that they had this sense of separation. Because many cultures, there was not the sense of separation. There was this sense of ineffable oneness and unity. And that is the, the solution to racism. And that is also the solution to ending this endless war scenario. Because if you realize that all these, quote, enemies that get created for us periodically, um, they're trying to create a new enemy, the aliens. Um, that in reality, that's all sort of pure ignorance and the opposite of ignorance is knowledge and knowledge is knowing that we are all one being. And as you know, Erwin Schrodinger, the great uh, quantum physicist, Nobel prize winning physicist in 1908 said the total number of minds in the universe is one. It's a singularity. So if actually we use this quote in this documentary close yeah, encounters for the fifth time because it's so it's, it's a profound sustained statement by a scientist who had found that in fact and of course tesla knew this also this universal one uh that the, the consciousness field is a singularity but we chop it up into our egos and separate ourselves from each other in reality we're never separate and so when we're wanting to make contact with these civilizations step one is this state of, of realization that the consciousness within us and the light of awareness in a sentient being from the Andromeda galaxy is a singularity. There's no separation in space or time or essence. The essence of being human is not the fact that we're homo sapien descended from monkey apes. It's the fact that we have consciousness and we have the ability to be aware of awareness in a meditative state, in an enlightened state. Well, so do these civilizations that are from other star systems. They're conscious and they're sentient. 
and the ability for them to be conscious of consciousness and us to be conscious of that consciousness, that's where we meet. That's the meeting space. There's the go-to meeting. So it's like that Rumi quote, beyond the field, beyond right and wrong, there is a field that will meet you there. Yes. It's so, beyond duality. It's beyond all this duality. So and, I talk a lot about how I say, and it's very interesting, I say, um, it, and that's why it fits perfect with, with having you on. I, talk, I say, you aren't separate from what you want. You aren't separate from other people and you aren't separate from the creator. Uh, you, you can't be, it's, 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 it's impossible. So do you say that the core of all of this for the human civilization to evolve, to awaken this 1%, this mass shift in collective consciousness happens from 1% and for you as an individual to have conscious contact with interplanetary beings, it comes from, and the core problem of all these things, it comes from an identification to yourself as a body and in the world of form so totally that you, um, you aren't aware of yourself as soul or consciousness. And when we have that really? shift, that's what opens up the keys to uh, advancing human civilization and all these things. Yeah. And we're not going to be able to advance actually until we understand sort of deep spirituality at this level, as opposed to say religiosity. The outer forms of religion. I always tell people, people conflate those two things. We have to begin to understand there's a universality to, uh, to being, to, to the conscious self that is not just limited to one race or one religion or one planet. That we're already, I mean, people don't recognize it. We're already in an interplanetary moment and have been for decades. What are we doing with it? Well, we're letting the worst elements ruin it and we have to be able to go beyond the mythology and the disinformation that's out there about aliens uh, to, to sort of ask the question of if they exist and they do and we're here they're obviously interested in our planet right now for a number of reasons frankly i think we're viewed as an existential threat to other worlds out there because we're so violent and we're going into space with weapons I think we're, I think there's a very deep concern. Everyone's always worried about the ETs. I go, no, you've got it upside down. <laughs> we're the problem. You want to, it's like the Michael Jackson, look the man in the mirror, look in the mirror. You want to see where the problem is? Go look in the mirror. Um, uh, so I said, we have to have some humility about how completely savage our civilization still is uh, in terms of war and murder and violence and all these things. Uh, that is not the case in other planets that have become interstellar. Um, if you have reached uh, what's called a level one civilization, where you can travel amongst the stars, you have reached the social and spiritual level where at least you're not murdering each other through warfare. That is an absolute requirement for you to be allowed out of your solar system. Okay. So we haven't gotten there yet. These other civilizations or like brothers that have advanced further along beyond where we are. Um, but the fact is, is that they are hopeful that we'll get there, but we're not going to get there through conventional thinking. We're going to have to do a really, we're going to have to step back from all of our assumptions and look at the fact that how are these civilizations, what is their operating paradigm? Because we're always wanting to, as they say, fight the last war. But we're wanting to also extrapolate onto the ETs, you know, what our level of science and technology is. And this is just one of the problems with humans hmm. being narcissistic. Is that like, if you were to go back, I live down the road from Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello. If I were to take this computer or my smartphone and show that to Thomas Jefferson, it would just, you'd be something from, uh, uh, you'd be mythological being from uh, uh, a fantasy world. There's no way they'd understand it. Well, we're dealing with civil, that's 200 years ago, right? We're dealing with civilizations that are on the hundreds of thousands to millions of years, and a couple of them a billion years past where we are. So their science and technology, all of it is interfacing with consciousness and the consciousness field their guidance systems on their spacecraft, their communication systems are interfacing with thought directly to electronics, but 
very sophisticated electronics. Um, they've had the innate development to, uh, you know, achieve accurate telepathy and telekinesis. Uh, a lot of the phenomenon we see when I'm out in the desert or out in an area having contact, we have all kinds of cool phenomenon that happen that would look like something out of the cities, the S-I-D-D-H-I-S, the extraordinary powers and abilities of the ancient masters that they're described in the Vedas. Um, and in fact, what I tell people is that if you look at every one of those powers and abilities that are based in deep understanding of consciousness and that the cosmos is conscious, each one of those can be made routine through technology, levitation, teleportation, telepathy, bilocation, transdimensional communication, traversing different dimensions, not just 3D, but into the so-called astral and spirit world. Those are all able to be done technologically through very high frequency electromagnetic fields. And, and we don't have time to get into this, but this is a science that is well known in the intelligence community. What we're doing under the stars with the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind uh, project and the CE5 contact app, takes you, you can take it out in the field with you, is to use our innate hardware and software that we're given as conscious beings, spirits, to learn how to make contact with these civilizations. But we need to always remember that their technologies that they have are mind-blowingly advanced. I mean, just amazing stuff that we've seen. Uh, you know, when you look at this documentary, it's 0.01% of the archive. But we could, you know, you what are you going to do? You can only do so much. You know, a two-hour two -hour film that you want to have millions. Of, our goal is to have at least 80 around 80 million people see this movie and then begin to practice this technique and form teams. The reason we did the CE5 contact app, if you go to the Google or iTunes store, you can get it, that that app actually enables you to be trained to do this, but also you can then, it, because it has a networking messaging capability, it will show you everyone in your area who's doing it. So you can hook up with them you know, you can go out on the beach or go out under the stars and, you know, or if you are locked down because it's where you are, it's still locked down. You can do it remotely with people because remember consciousness, it doesn't care about the distance. There is no distance. And that's important for everyone to understand. And it's something we always talk about is that really time and space is, is an illusion and consciousness is traveling instantaneously. And yeah. This is so important now for people to understand when you talk about the 1% is because that as we have this shift in our energy levels and our energy moves outside of the matrix of fear and control and our energy raises and we uh, recognize our true identity as soul rather than body, our consciousness raises and that is all sending off a different frequency level to the collective consciousness that other people that might be not awake yet can subconsciously tap into. And that's the type of awakening that you're discussing. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Well, actually it, it, it the, the, when enough people start doing it, it spontaneously moves others along. Hmm. That's the whole 1% effect. This is what's so interesting about this is that everyone, again, we have to transcend, go beyond this idea of separation that's so part of our Western culture. There is no separation. Mm. We're all integrated in this fabric of a conscious living organism of the cosmos. And when a certain number of people begin to create, let's say, a wave in consciousness and activity, it will affect everyone else in their society. And in fact, it also affects everyone on other planets. There's no limit to it. But it, it begins to create a movement in that direction. And it transitions. It's, a, it's like the phase transition in helium. It gets that 1% and then the whole thing changes. So it, it, we have to have sort of the priming the pump effect of a critical number of people doing this. But in a coherent way, with intention. It can't just be some scattered effort. So that's why we're trying to create this 1% effect for uh, enlightenment and contact. 
because there's not going to be a civilization on this planet if we don't get the concepts of unity and peace correct, not just on Earth, but out in space. So we're, we're not going to, everybody wants to, you know, do a little baby step. And I tell people world peace would have been really cool in 1918. Too late, missed that boat. Now we've got to get universal peace nailed. So we've got as above, so below, we've got to create um, a peaceful civilization here that is ready to interface peacefully and not with weapon systems, these interstellar civilizations. And that's what they're waiting on. People say, why don't they land on the White House? I remember Larry King, and that used to be a, a guy on CNN. So right. why don't they land on the White House lawn? I go, who's White House? I say, you're being ethnocentric. You think they should land on our White House? Not Why not the White House in Nigeria or Egypt? I mean, you know, why this White House? So as a species, we have to realize they're from a civil, all these ET civilizations, of which there are thousands, are from worlds that have integrated into a functional, global, conscious civilization that have gone interstellar. And by virtue of going interstellar, they have mastered trans-dimensional technologies that interface with other dimensions and consciousness. They have to, because there's no way to go from one star system to another at less than this, at the speed of light. It's too slow. You know, the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years. It takes you at the speed of light two and a half million years to get there and two and a half million years to get back. That's the proof of the fact that once you begin to be aware of true cosmic awareness and the cosmic physics, the only path to understanding the future and creating a good future ha has to do with the science of consciousness. And so what they're doing is they are harnessing the ether or universal energy field, and then they are directing consciousness to send an intention of, I of I want to go to planet Earth, for instance, and they're moving through that outside of time space, and that's what allows them to travel like that, and that's what the government's hiding. Is that what's happening? Partially, there is a physics. Okay. You have to understand there's a material science behind this as well. So again, you know, you can't just stay locked into the consciousness separate from the science because science is consciousness. Okay. The material world is conscious. So we're dealing with civilizations that understand this very salient central point for their way they operate, their operating system. And, but it means that the technologies are integrated with the bioelectric field of the ET's being and their thought, but that the technology of the craft is actually very sophisticated electronic. It's an electric electromagnetic spacecraft where the entire craft uh, at certain voltages at certain very high frequencies and resonant frequencies can go from a solid material item like my hands clapping here and drop into a, a higher or go into a higher resonant field that's in the let's call it the near astral and go from point A to B, skirting along the astral underbelly of the cosmos. But as a physical spacecraft, and then when it gets to where it wants to be, it rematerializes into 3D. So, so it, it goes from like it's, the... it's, it goes from 3D to 3D via trans-dimensional systems. But those are very scientific. There's a physics. I know guys who work this out to the equations by the way, but they're in classified projects and underground skiffs. So it's kind of like the observer effect where the subatomic particle can be a particle, but it can also be invisible and it can be a wave. So they're able to be a particle and then essentially dematerialize into, into a wave state that allows them to move through the astral dimension kind of basically. Like, yeah. Like, and they've done experiments with particles teleporting that way. Uh, and in fact, you know, Einstein called the spooky effect where he observed the same thing in two places at once with no time delay. So uh, they've and done that's that what they're and that's what they're using. But they're using that on the scale of an entire spacecraft. OK, that might be 26 miles across instead you know, of a little way. subatomic particle. They're doing exactly. the spacecraft. So just take that. But, you know, that there's some serious engineering going on here, my friend. 
Um, so, uh, and, and we understand this. I mean, this is understood. Right. But, Fascinating. Uh, so, um, man, it's, uh, and it, I mean, it makes sense with everything we talk about on this channel here. So let's, let's go here. So, um, when we're talking about the 1%, we're talking about this collective consciousness and the shift. I think there's a lot of people that are, uh, feel depressed with what's going on in the world or they feel powerless. They feel like the shadow government controls everything or just the paradigm of the world is so set in stone and what can I do about it? And, and if I'm correct, what I kind of hear you saying is your intention, you don't need to physically be Dr. Stephen Greer and be making documentaries to change the world. You don't need a YouTube channel with a bunch of people watching like Jake Ducey. You don't need to be doing something. It can actually, you can actually help uh, accelerate this shift of human consciousness through consciousness and intention alone by some of these things that we're talking about, by changing the essentially what you are broadcasting, the frequency you're broadcasting from intention and consciousness via meditation to focus on world peace and people awakening. That's kind of what you're saying? Yes, but do it with other people because here's, okay. the, here's the magic. Um, when Dr. John at Princeton, uh, the engineering department had the, the lab where they were doing these experiments with random number generators, they found that if one person was putting their awareness to have an outcome, it had a certain effect that was measurable. But if two people that loved each other or were united did it, it was exponential. Hmm. So what happens when you have thousands or millions of people? So see, what I'm wanting to move towards is because it's, it's an exponentially greater effect for people to be connected to each other doing this. There's a real mystery in people coming together and doing things together. But again, it doesn't take, you know, a 51%. It's not voting for the president. It's a, it's a 1% effect and probably less if the people involved are highly enlightened and have very clear intent. But certainly at 1% of just ordinary people are doing meditation and coming together with an intent and purpose, it has this huge transformational effect that changes the other 99%. So, you know, there's the 1% of the super rich sociopaths. Well, let's create another 1% that work together. Amen. That are, so that are people wanting to do enlightenment, transform the plant. This is eminently doable. So I tell people there's no reason to be despondent and um, depressed hmm. about. I mean, the world is going to get more and more screwed up until we fix it. Hmm. I'm just like, let's just put this on the table. You yeah. ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Uh, I've been what I know is coming, you ain't seen nothing yet. So what people need to begin to do is to focus on their innate abilities to connect in consciousness and with each other for a transformation of the planet towards a state of peace and enlightenment and also universality. It has to include this universal component because we're already being visited and we're, they're waiting for us to wake up. So people can do this. It's not difficult to do. People find, you know, it's interesting because on my Twitter feed, I, I get things all the time. And on our, our website, SeriousDisclosure.com, we get these people write in. Like we had this truck driver in Croatia. He got this app who was, uh, you know, the CE5 contact app is what you put in CE5 contact. And he was stopped on the, in the mountains of Croatia, just doing the meditation, but also doing the, what we call coherent thought sequencing, which is when you image and see the, e, the ETs and invite them and vector them into where you were. So he was showing him where he was in this truck by visually in consciousness where he was. And suddenly this ET crap materializes right to the left of the truck and floats over the cab and then goes to the other side. And he gets this message that, we received your, we were here with you. And, and then it dematerializes. And this is like a truck drive. You know, it's not someone who's like, you know, dropping ayahuasca and with lavender wands and crystals and laying around in an ashram. I mean, he's like a freaking truck driver. So I tell people, you know, everyone can do this. It's like really simple. It's just, you have to know you can do it. And, you know, you don't need all the accoutrement and all the trips and all that, you know, just do, just be real. 
And it's, it, it's really, for me, the most gratifying thing of what's happening right now is seeing just thousands and thousands of ordinary people doing this. And they go, oh my God, I did this. And I went outside and this ship appeared and it signaled to me. And then I had contact with this being because I knew this would happen, frankly, because when I first had this happen in 1973, I was told there will be a time when enough people will understand consciousness hmm. that we can make open contact with humanity bypassing the government bypassing and that's that's our it's our time to do it this is our time so i talk all about as it pertains to imaging and and since energy is never created or destroyed it already exists in a higher plane so you're just materializing it here in third dimension and it's a similar process in conclusion here as we're coming to an end truly appreciate your time so you're saying the connection process and what someone can do at home. Step number one, download the CE app. If you haven't seen Dr. Greer's other movies, watch them with your friends, watch them with other people so you can do this together. Unacknowledged, been viewed 600 million times, and then conscious, uh, CE5 is the most recent one that came out in April. That one has to do more with consciousness and the process of contact. So what you're saying is, in a similar process that my audience is aware of, you are essentially imagining you're you're imagining that you're already in contact with them and because consciousness travels instantaneously that's signaling and then you're vectoring like starting at planet earth dropping all the way down to your city going from the map all the way down and in the consciousness as if it's already taking place and that's what accesses the contact and what someone at home that's saying i want to do a thought experiment to try this, that's what they would be doing? Yes, and the ETs are scanning all frequencies for that. Hmm. Remember, they have technologies that can scan when you're sending something out through thought. Huh. Like we can scan a laser, they can scan a beam of thought. And they can pick up the frequency being signaled. Correct. That's fascinating. I had never heard you say that part. So yeah. you watching this, you can go Watch this interview. If you found this interesting, watch it with a couple people. And then end, as I always say about on this on my channel, I say, don't believe everything I'm saying. Just sus I always say, suspend your disbelief. Suspend your disbelief and do a thought experiment. And that's what I always talk about on my channel. Now, let's do one now. And, and you can go and you can do it with your friends, um, with your husband, with your wife, with your children, who are probably have a lot less conditioning than you. They might end up being the one that does it properly. And so in conclusion, um, can you just give us a little summary of how you would go about it? Just a normal meditation as if you were visualizing, um, if you wouldn't mind elaborating or doing a little quick couple second walkthrough, and I know you got to get going. Yeah. Well, the main thing is to be mindful. I, I tell people you can, you know, sit and close your eyes and you can do a, a meditation with the breath, the breathing. You can do it with a mantra. You can do it with an object or a small prayer. And then once you connect to the silent space within, become aware that that consciousness that's observing the breath or the mantra, whatever it is, if that consciousness is unbounded and begin to put yourself into that ocean of unbounded mind and then open up to a remote place. So you can then say, I can allow myself now to see with my inner sight consciousness, what's out in space. I can be drawn to where these interstellar civilizations are under the earth or under the ocean or out by Saturn or wherever they are, and then make a connection to see who the ETs are and see the, what they look like and then invite them to your location. So once you get a sense of them, you may not see them visually, you may just feel their presence. Then you show them where you are. You literally show them your home, the landscape, where you're located. And if you're good at visualization, you can actually show them, zoom in from out in space to the place on the earth coming into uh, like you would zooming in from a satellite view of the earth to your home uh, and show them where you are and then invite them in universal peace. In other words, stay in that universal state of consciousness 
which is beyond all fear and let them know that we are all one being together, that the totality of beings in the cosmos is that we are all one and that there is no separation and that no matter what they may look like or anything, that we are essentially the same being. So it's really important to stay centered in that state of oneness because otherwise something shows up and you freak out because you go back into your animal, your separate animal aspect. Hmm. So I tell people that meditation is not only the technique to make contact, but it's the preparatory for yourself to have contact. Hmm. Because if you're not centered in something greater than just your animal aspect, the, the aspect of your ego and individuality, that's not going to cut it you're, because you're going to get freaked out. Um, so the, the, I, you know, there, it's like when Arjuna on the battlefield with Krishna, Krishna says a little of this eliminates all fear. The, this with a capital T was this field of unbounded, pure consciousness. So if you stay in that pure state of unbounded consciousness and are anchored in that, you can walk through fire. You can contact anyone and you will stay centered in a calm state as opposed to just completely falling apart like a $3 watch uh, and freaking out. So, <laughs> and I actually, as a, as a trauma doctor, an emergency doctor, the nurses knew that when something was really bad, I mean, like really bad, um, that I would, get, they, could say, they could see that I would be getting very calm. Now, some doctors get hysterical and throw scalpels. and I just become very zen-like and calm. And I, it would be flow consciousness. So, and that's a technique where the more challenged you are in your reality and view of things, the more you need to go deep within and stay centered in that unbounded field so that you don't get tossed about on the surface of the ocean of the storm of life. You're, you're anchored into the depths of the quietness of the unbounded ocean of being. So that uh, you can do that, whether you're an airline pilot or a doctor or whatever you do. Um, I did, I did, I have done it in all walks of life, you know, all my different work I've done. Um, and it's very powerful, but when you're doing this, it's important. And that's why doing it with a few people is also nice because if everyone's coherent in a small, you don't have to be a lot of people, you know, I've done this for thousands of people at a time, but if you do, you know, three, four, five people, six people, you know, if it gets more than 10, it gets to be a little bit incoherent, but you can do it. Uh, if you're good at leading a group, you have to be very good at maintaining coherence with a group if you have a lot of people. But the coherence is really key because when an event, like you see some of the images, if you look at this movie, Close Encounters of the Fifth Town, you're going to see stuff that have come, like ETs that appeared right beside us and stuff. You're going to jump right out of your skin if you're not in a state of centeredness and calm, even though they're completely nonviolent, non hostile. They were healers, actually. Uh, this one man had his hearing loss healed. Um, you know, you, you remember that man, Ed Moe. It was amazing. Amazing, beautiful story. I was one person down. There was a friend of mine who's a medical student, and then that man, and the ET appeared right there. And, but if you were in a state of just, let's call it animal consciousness, just your own individual, and you weren't anchored in some of this deeper aspect, I mean, some people like just, aren't ready for that. So I tell people preparatory to contact is becoming sort of on this spiritual path of being centered, but it's not, so it's not only an operational state uh, of making the technique, but it's also essential for your own, um, let's call it inner conscious stability to be able to maintain a, a sort of being centered in your deeper aspect. Because once you understand that you, are actually the unbounded being. And the unbounded being is expressing through you. You're not afraid of anything. This is why everyone says, aren't you afraid of these fascists? I say, no, I'm not afraid of them. So what if they kill me? I died already. I mean, come at, bring it on, honey. You know, my attitude is, <laughs> you know, I'm a terror actually in these sort of meetings with these sort of, I say, yeah, so what? You know, well, it was funny, one thing I said to one of them, I said, if you whack me, I'm going to be so much more trouble to you on the other side than I will be here stuck in this plan. 
That's so funny. And I was being a spirit warrior, the Shambhala warrior. It's almost funny because they have all the money and like these, all these like technologies, but what they uh, don't have is the higher plane of consciousness. Yes. So it's and, almost and they like, know that. and they know oh, it. And, and, and yes. They it. And they're jealous of that. You know, I had a, I had a member, a friend of one of the Royal families in Europe come up to me and they say, you know, the people who are in this, committee dealing with this are very jealous of you. I said of me, I was very young then. I didn't know. And they said, yes, cause you're free to do this and you're not, and they're not, they're not free to do anything. And they're living in this very pinched narrow world. And we can live in a state of complete freedom. So this is another reason why I don't want temporal power, organization, money. I don't care about any of that because I know that it's, it's, it's not what people think. So I, I tell people we're so lucky to live a, a sort of in a more humble way. I mean, people say a doctor. I said, yeah, but it's humble compared to people who are playing with trillions of dollars. Um, but, it, you know, you just sort of it, you're better off keeping it simple and pure. And it's the purity of the heart and the purity of the intent that the ETs pick up on. And you can't fake that. And these guys know that. You know, I had a member of, of uh, the committee that deals with this say to me once, um, well, actually, I shared this story in the documentary, the Prince uh, Hans Adam von Liechtenstein. And he said, oh, I'd go all over the world, because you know, as a jet, and there'd be all these UFO sightings, and they would be happening before I got there. But when I was there, nothing. But when I left, they would come back. And he said, maybe it's my attitude. I said, bingo, it is, you know. But it's also who and what you are. You're, you're not. You're viewing this in a way of conflict. You're viewing this uh, in a way of, of you know, he he kind of wants this big interplanetary war so Christ will come back and kind of wacky sort of theology. Um, and I'm going. They're not really interested in a dude like that. You know, I think they, the the janitor who cleans his toilet, who's pure-hearted, is more likely to make contact with these interstellar ambassadors than this member of the royal family given his attitude so it all has to do with that my friend that's where the action is amen and it it makes total sense right because if everything's frequency they can pick up on the frequency as well and if if they're if they're this evolved beings why are they going to go manifest themselves to somebody that they could pick up the oh, yeah. fear or evil out of it, they're not going to do it. And that's well, the they, good news for everyone that's listening. <laughs> that's the good news because everyone who's just uh, just a, a, a pure hearted, regular person can do this. I mean, this is why I tell people it sounds like it's such a, a big lift to do. It. I said, no, everyone can do this. And that's the that's the takeaway from this. Try it. You'll have a great time. It's fun. It's fun to do it. And it's very enlightening to do it. And the more of us that do this together, the more that it creates this morphogenic field shift for the planet, where we move out of this era of chaos and destruction into the civilization that we know is has to be established here. Absolutely amazing. Hey, everybody listening to this, share this video. Share this video on Twitter. Share this video on Facebook. Share this video on email. Plug it into your computer and invite 10 of your friends over and watch this interview. Get as many people to watch this as you possibly can, especially the second half where we discuss about the important aspects of consciousness and intention as it pertains to conscious contact with multidimensional beings and as it pertains to us advancing the human civilization, the human species, and to uplift and raise the collective consciousness so that we can come out of this this kind of field of darkness that we seem to find ourselves kind of stuck in recreating over and over and over again. Um, Well, thank you very much. Maybe sometime we can do a joint joint with my YouTube channel and yours. We probably reach a couple million people. Um, A joint meditation doing this somewhere down the road. 